Hi. Um, it's a question on UCAL. Yeah. Uh, there has been an opinion that we might be disadvantaged by UCAL scoring. Yeah. Um, so you want to comment on that? I think it comes back to the one of the themes that's run through what we've been discussing, which is that PSC compared to many other liver diseases is quite unpredictable in the way that it progresses. <coughs> and therefore, um, there is an argument that UKL does not adequately predict survival for patients with PSC. I think that's a very fair argument. Um, do, are they worse served than other patient populations? Possibly. Um, we tend, most centres I think tend to for all the reasons of uncertainty about what the prognosis will be, there's quite a low threshold for when patients get listed with PSC. So once people start running into problems developing complications related to PSC, like recurrent cholangitis, if they develop some ascites, if they become jaundiced and that persists, um, many centres will list patients relatively early for PSC. But I think, um, I think there's a difference of opinion about whether UKL is fair to patients with PSC. Um, there's certainly a lot of work going on at the moment about changing the system for organ distribution around the UK. So rather than having organs given to each of the transplant centres and they use them as best as they see fit for, for the best outcomes in their group of patients, but trying to look at organs as a national resource and, and picking patients where you can get the best outcome patients to be transplanted where you can get the best outcomes um, nationally, I suppose, um, but, but also changing away from UKL to a better scoring system that will more satisfactorily uh, account for the prognosis with, for patients with liver disease. And the, if we do move to that sort of system, uh, a new system, it will take a while for us to kind of work out who are the people that are benefiting and are any groups losing out on that system. And, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity to that at the moment. But any system that's going to rely on us hitting 49 before we get access to this national list mm -hmm. is going to disadvantage us while we've got clinicians in the local centre making feeding into the decisions that are made, I mean, that must be good for us. I think, um, I think given, given that currently the only, tra I mean, that transplant is the only curative treatment, although we know that it recurs, um, uh, my personal view is that there is, a, there is an added advantage for patients with PSC to be seen in centres which are most familiar with transplantation because it's, it's kind of picking up on the signs where people may be running into difficulties. Because, as I say, transplant is a great treatment for the right people at the right time, but there's a window. If people are too sick, it's not a good treatment. Uh, sorry, if they're too well, it's not a good treatment. But if they're too sick, it's not a, uh, a good treatment either. And the problem is it's quite a blunt tool because you're trying to pick someone today to get transplanted in nine or 12 months time. So it's a very nuanced process. Um, and I, you know, I, I share your concern that there are probably patients who have got PSC who are doing very well in some ways, but that we, if we were seeing them, might be starting to think, look, this is somebody who's coming into that window where we should be thinking about transplant. And if in a non-transplant centre, it may be that, that where they've got less experience of that, they'll, that opportunity being be missed. Thanks. Yeah, um, I've been maybe watching a bit too much TV, but I'm seeing on the news several different um, developments medically that may, ha may help people in our situation who require liver transplants. And there's probably three of them that I've seen. Um, one development seems to be around um, maintaining the life of donor organs for a longer period of time that allows them to travel further and to be transplanted, you know, for, for potentially for a greater number of people. Another one is mechanical, some kind of mechanical liver that operates instead of real live livers. And the third one is about stem cell treatment, 
which could you know, develop new livers that could be yeah. transplanted in us. Are you able to comment on either of those three scenarios? Yeah, so, so the first one is about machine perfusion. So this is when, when the organ is taken out of the donor and before it's transplanted into the recipient. The classical way that the organ was transferred was uh, it's flushed out, all the blood's flushed out of the organ, it's packed on ice, and then it's transferred to the transplant centre. It's, it's rewarmed, reperfused, and then implanted into the, or it's, it's basically rewarmed within the patient. Um, and there's, a, there's um, a desire to try and increase the number of transplants and increase the number of organs. And one of the ways of going around that is to try and use machine perfusion where you effectively connect a machine that will oxygenate the liver and measure the effluent from the liver. So measure the liver function tests and the synthetic function of the liver. And the, the belief is twofold. One is that it might better preserve the liver while it's being transferred from the donor hospital to the recipient hospital. But it also, so it may improve the outcomes for the organs that are being used, but it may also allow us to use organs that we might previously have turned down because based on the information we would have on the end of the phone, there was too much concern. By connecting them to the machine and measuring the function of that liver over a period of a number of hours, it may be possible to, to kind of push the boundary a wee bit and take some organs that we would otherwise have said no to. So that is definitely part of the NHSBT's plan to 2020. Um, it's, it's, it adds significantly to the complexity of the, uh, the donor process if you're connecting up a machine and transferring rather than a liver in a box, a, machi a machine connected to a, a liver. And it also potentially lengthens the interval between the, the time that the organ's retrieved and when it's implanted, because the evidence would suggest that you, to make this worthwhile, you have to put it on the machine for six or eight hours or whatever. So there's a number of clinical trials going on within the UK at the moment to look specifically at that. We are involved in some of them. So that was one point. The, the mechanical one is there's, there are liver sort of assist devices um, there's things called Mars, ELAD. Um, there's also a bio, trying to develop a, a, a sort of bio artificial liver here a, a, as well. Um, current, unfortunately, unlike dialysis, kidney dialysis, there isn't good evidence for these uh, in clinical trials for these actually improving clinical outcomes for patients at the moment. So um, it's, I think it's, it's. It was a great hope that we would be able to develop some kind of machine liver dialysis, but thus far. Something that was transplanted into the, liver, into the body and almost piggybacked the liver, took over the function of the liver, and so I think in the end it helped to regenerate the actual holy cirrhosis liver that. Uh, I'm, I'm, not I'm not sure of the specifics of that. I've not heard about that. But I mean, sometimes uh, people have partial uh, auxiliary partial transplants where they get tends to be people with, who don't have cirrhosis. So what you do is you give them a portion of liver and you then wait for that portion of liver. That portion of liver tides them over until their own liver can regenerate. But that's a, that's a different issue. The, the, the third thing you asked about was um, around stem cells or basically build, uh, growing. growing new livers. And that's, that's an area of particular research interest here. Um, so Professor Pinzani and uh, uh, one of our PhD, one of uh, Massimo Pinzani's research fellows is working on um, trying to create the scaffold, the, the, uh, the structure, um, the fibrotic structure of the liver. I don't know, Massimo, do you want to say, there's a poster up there. Do you want to say for a few words about it? I think he's, he's, he's stepped out. But yes, there's, there's a number of things. Birmingham are doing a stem cell trial in PSC, so Phil Newsom. Um, it's only going to be around 10 or maybe maximum of 20 patients. Um, stem cells have, have not really produced the outcomes that had been hoped for them at this stage. That's not to say that they won't be key to, um, say, the development of, of the sorts of livers that Massimo is going to talk about. I don't know. Thank you. No, just to add to 
a few words about the stem cell you mentioned. Uh, there are some studies where you know the the, the patient is uh, uh, the bone marrow of the patient is taken you know away with a syringe, so it's with it from the bones, and then he's washed and it's reinfused. And these are patients with very advanced liver disease, and. The few studies that have been done show that there is like a, an improvement of some clinical uh, function for two, three months, okay? Uh, this is not, you know, in my opinion, it's not regeneration. So you take some cells from the bone marrow. These cells are more li mostly blood cells, macrophages. They are cells able to eat the fibrosis. So there is a, a reduction in portal pressure and you have a slight improvement. But overall, I don't think this is the way to go. I mean, it's a... Uh, just like a minor improvement for a few months. So what we are doing at the Royal Free, uh, Doug mentioned the number of donors and the number of transplants. There is a, an important point here that about 45, 40 to 45% of donor liver are not used uh, for different reasons. Uh, the most common because the liver is too fat. So uh, if you transplant a fatty liver into a patient, it's gonna go into lots of oxidative stress reactions, so it's gonna fail. Uh, other reasons are that the patient has a, has a cancer, so is you know a good. Tr you may transplant a cancer together with the with the liver, and so uh, overall in the UK there are about 900 livers that are not used. And uh, until some time ago, all these livers were just going to the bin, so they were not used. So at the Royal Free, uh, since uh, four or five years ago, there is a. Um, an, a charity or an, eth an ethical group called Tissue for Patient Benefit. So all the organs that are no use are taken to the real free. E there is a, a program to recycle this organ. Uh, what we have been doing, Giuseppe Massi was here, he just went out to, to, uh, to talk to somebody. Uh, we have been able to take a human liver, remove all the cells. So you see a picture there. You know, the, the white looks like a jellyfish. It's a, it's a human liver. All the cells are removed. This is a <coughs> scaffold. It's a, it's a big scaffold. And on the side, you see scanning electron microscopy showing that the structure of the scaffold is perfect. You know, there is no, it looks like, you know, it, you just remove the cell, and this scaffold is ready to be repopulated with liver cells. <coughs> so, what we are doing now, we start step by step. So, because there, there are not only hepatocytes or biliary cells in the liver, there are endothelial cells. There are stromal cells, there are uh, Kupfer cells, which are the defense system. So we need to find a way to repopulate the liver with waves of repopulation. And they have to be in the right sequence, you know, not to, to mix them up. What we are doing now, just a, an immediate clinical application, uh, patients that have liver-based inborn error of metabolism, usually they are children, they go into metabolic decompensation quite early. They are, one attempt to treat them is to infuse human hepatocytes in the, in the bloodstream. Some of these hepatocytes go into the liver and they basically compensate the, the enzymatic defect for a few months. But then this is not feasible you know, in the long term because you, you have to do this every two, three months. Because the hepatocytes don't survive very long if they are alone, you know, swimming in the bloodstream. What we are doing now, we are giving to these hepatocytes a home, a scaffold, together with other cell uh, support cells, and our plan is to implant this scaffold in the, in the liver or in the, in the abdomen to replace the enzymes that are missing. So let's say we are at the beginning of this, of this uh, era of uh, regenerative medicine for the liver, but one important thing that the Royal Free is the main hub to receive in the UK, <coughs> they discard the liver and will make good use, you know, for step-by-step uh, step to arrive one day to have a, a, a bridge liver to, imp to be implanted uh, that is made of a human scaffold with human cells. We are also going through the a pathway where we take a, 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 a type of stem cell called inducible pluripotent stem cell. So, for example, we take a skin biopsy from a patient, we grow fibroblasts, which are let's say infantry cells, you know, they are just the cells that make, you know, the, the strength of the skin or other organ. And there is a, a new system with four shots of uh, oncogenes, or they are oncogenes, but they are now related to cancer. You can 
differentiate these cells into different types. For example, hepatocytes, cholangiocytes, brain cells. So in this case, if you are able to do this, this has already been done for the beta cells, for the pancreas, for the treatment of uh, diabetes. These cells will not re be recognized as foreign because they come from the patient. So this will go into a line called personalized medicine, meaning that the regeneration is done on a scaffold, which is from somebody else, but it's not, it doesn't really elicit any reaction, uh, but the cells will be the cells from the patient. So if you want to have a look at the, at the picture. How many years away do you feel we could be until we make a breakthrough in stem cell treatment? Well, it, it depends on how you, you know, what you want to do. I think that uh, there, are, there is already st stem cell treatment where you don't need to to build a scaffold, you can just, for example, for the, for, for the eye, for uh, ophthalmology, for the eye medicine, there is already something. Uh, uh, so let's say the era of stem cell medicine is already on. You know, it's just that when you get to organs like the liver, which is very complex, you know, you need you need more time. But I have seen recently a prediction, and in 2000, 2050, most of the surgery. Uh, will be done with or a bioengineered organs, so it means like scaffold and different type of cell rebuilt in waves, something like that. So, <laughs> so it's a long way, I know. <laughs> but, no, no, oh, but, oh, no, no, no. But when I say, no, when I say, when I say uh, 2050, I mean to have you know this in all the complexity. But between now and 2050, will be step by step. Uh, potential application. I said, it's asked me when we, we are going to go walk on Mars. I mean, so it also depends how much funding, how much government uh, initiatives. You know, this, you know, when you go to, I am in a, in, a, in a, the MRC board grants, and, and sometimes we have only eight million for to, to distribute for fifty proposal. In the end, you know, the good proposal get three hundred thousand pounds, which you don't do very much. For initiative like this, you need millions, you know, because you have to use bioreactors, you have to use, you have to buy a big machine, you need to have lots of personnel, you need GMP facility, just like, a, let's say, a, a space like three times this room, which is GMP, means good uh, manufacturing practice. So each step is uh, like you prepare, like a product which is sterile, you know, has all the biocompatibility. So uh, this is what the, what it cost. Okay, thanks very much, Marcel.